We have, I think today we have one of the most fun Bible studies to go through ever. Uh, I'm excited about it. And thematically, it kind of has to do with a particular significant day. I posted a little thing on Facebook uh, this weekend asking people to, to put a comment about Donald Trump. No, I'm kidding. Uh, about their uh, top five most significant days. <laughs> Sorry. It's a cheap joke, isn't it? I, I asked people to, to, to comment with their top five most significant days. And I didn't say necessarily they needed to be good days, but most significant days. And it's kind of interesting. It, they're, you know, kind of predictable. Uh, for believers, you know, people are saying, you know, well, the day I came to Christ. Yes, that's the day everything changed. That's the wonderful day, isn't it? But then, you know, the day people got married or the day they had kids or, or the day, that's, you know, something significant happened. We have lots of them, don't we? We have, we have times in our lives, and they're not necessarily those kinds of things that we would say, well, that's the most significant thing. Sometimes it's like a sickness that happens, or sometimes it's like it's a death that happens, or, or maybe you got fired from a job or something. There are things there. Your whole life changes in a very short amount of time. There are significant days. We have lots of them. And sometimes, you know, sometimes they're a lot of fun, and sometimes they're like, ah, I don't want another significant day. Of course, all of these, you know, we're looking forward to the most significant of days when we go to be with the Lord or He comes for us. Well, today, we are going to be looking at one of the most significant days in all of human history. And it's a great Bible study. So uh, read with me, Mark chapter 11. We're just gonna cover the first 11 verses here. It says, as they approached Jerusalem at Bethang and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately as you enter it, you will find a a colt tied there on which no one uh, yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the 12, since it was already late. This is a significant day. It's the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of the passion. Jesus has come. He has presented himself here in Judea. He had been there before, But this is significant, it's special. It's the final week, the beginning of his passion. There's a saying some of you or probably all of you are familiar with, the devil is in the details. Right, we've all heard that. It's just an idiom that refers to a catch or some mysterious element hidden in the details of a plan. Details that will cause problems or complications or delays. It's interesting, that idiom actually derives from an earlier phrase, God is in the detail. Did anyone know that? It's a pretty interesting thing. Somehow, someone at some point took that idiom that was common and understood and they changed it to mean this negative thing. And of course it applies, there are You know, we get it that there's sometimes the devil is in the details. But here, as we look at this, the former idiom 
certainly applies. God is in the detail. The quote is commonly attributed to German architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, which I don't even know if I pronounced it that correctly, but he was a, a German architect of the Bauhaus. There was an earlier version of that particular saying coined uh, by a French novelist, the good God is in the detail. The good God is in the detail. And, and I thought it was interesting because as I was looking at this whole thing, it's like there are so many details to this story. It's a simple story, right? If, if you were going to tell the story, you could just say it like this. Jesus came to Jerusalem. He rode into the city on a donkey. That's the story. Ah, but there's so much more to it. There are so many more details that only a student of the Scripture is really going to understand, is really going to see. Yesterday, we had this big event. We had this golf tournament. Now, I'm not emotionally invested in the golf tournament. I couldn't really care less about golf. God bless the golfers. I, I mean, I, I, I'm just not a golfer. I tried it. I'm not good at it, so I don't care. I love you guys, and I appreciate, I appreciate that they get together, and I love this whole thing as an outreach. It's wonderful. It's awesome. They raise money for Samaritan's Purse. We love that. One of the things that's true, though, about it is the same thing that's true about many events like it is that there's so many things that go on behind the scenes that nobody knows about, the details. I was, I was trying to describe, you know, my, my role in this whole thing is I get to do the graphics, which I love, right? You guys know that that was my education. I was formerly a graphic artist, and I, and I love doing graphics, and it's, a, it's therapy for me. So if I can sit down for a few hours and work on some graphics, it's like, ah, uh, it's probably like golf for some guys. I just enjoy it. And I was describing to Bill, this year as I put together the graphics, I, didn't, I wanted a good picture of the tournament to kind of as a backdrop for all the, the different things that we did. And, and I had this picture of this beautiful fairway from, from uh, a kayak point. But, but, but like most pictures you take in the Northwest, the sky was all washed out. Everything was green, but then the sky was kind of just bland. And so I meticulously cut out in Photoshop, I cut out all the sky in this particular picture. I, I, you know, I heightened the greens and made it really vivid. But, but in the background, I dropped in another picture of a different sky. I mean, I spent hours on this, making it look just so and just right. And I was explaining it to him, and I, and I could just see the look on his face. He's like, yeah, huh. cool, Jim. Yeah, it looks great. And I was trying to get, I really am invested in this. It was really fun for me. It was really cool. But for most people, it was like, they, yeah, oh, someone took a picture and put it on there. Great. Cool. It was a detail. Just a little detail. It was just for me. I, I had fun doing that. It was, it was awesome. For me, it's part of the whole experience. There was another thing that happened this week. We had a, we had a late a late sponsor to the tournament, and part of the thing is, for the sponsors, they get their uh, business, they get yard signs on a particular hole to advertise their business, and you know, it's a way of saying thank you for giving the money, and, and so I had to order a couple of signs, and I got a couple of signs, but they didn't come with stands. And you know, you gotta have those metal stands, and so I was kinda freaked out, we don't have enough metal stands. Well, I had ordered some previously in the week, and they came with two extra stands. Now, no, it's just a stupid little thing, right? I mean, they're like probably a dollar fifty. But I, I was telling Bill again. I was kind of relating this thing. I was like, I was so excited about this silly little thing because I saw in it God's provision. He provided. Don't you love it when you see things like that? You ought to always have your eyes open, because the good God is in the details. We have this big event, it's a lot of fun, and there's probably a million details where God is just saying, you know what, I'm here, I'm with you, I'm blessing this. And sometimes it's not, it's not a huge thing, it's little things over and over and over again. The blessings of God are evident in the myriad of small things confirming his hand on the entire thing. And so it's true in our lives. It's certainly true 
in this story. Again, this is one of the most significant stories in the Bible. It's like a wedding or other significant event in our lives. There's lots of details. And I would just say this, in this story, as in our life, the details matter. The details matter. There's location. There's the the hour, the timing, right? These things apply, and certainly they apply in a wedding. You're going to get married. What's the first thing you do? You, well, first of all, you've got to find a girl or a guy. But, but you know, you, you pick a location, and you've got a time, and all that stuff. Those are all details that need to be worked out. But there's a million details. Some seem insignificant. Many are very significant. Again, you could just tell this story so easily. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, but the good God is in the details. I want to point out first, as we look at the details of this story, the location. Now, I already, uh, 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 it's uh, Beth Faye, I believe, is the proper pronunciation of this location. It's near Bethany. It's just opposite of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, it's the distance between Jerusalem and this place where this whole drama begins is what's called a Sabbath's day journey, which is 2,000 cubits. Now, this isn't, this isn't part of God's requirement, but it was certainly part of the law or what had become the law. Uh, they had come up with this idea that It was necessary that on the Sabbath they could only travel 2,000 cubits or about 3,000 feet, 10 football fields distance. So if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you recognize that the Mount of Olives is just that far away from the city, from the walls of the city. And so that's where this whole thing uh, begins. The Jews were limited by their religious rules as to how far they could travel on the Sabbath, which is an extension of the whole, you know, don't do any work, so they can't travel more than this, you know, it's like they're on a leash, you know, like a shock collar or something. Oh, I'm at my 2,000 cubit limit, limit, so. Uh, But nevertheless, it's interesting that Jesus began here, and it almost seems that the location itself is orchestrated by this very thing. Because the disciples would be going back and forth, back and forth. And so it was important that they would be near the city. Even Bethany, which was a little bit further, it was still very close in proximity. The location of all of this was important. It's like in real estate. What do they say? Location, location, location. It's very meaningful to me as they're building a gas station right next to our house. So location, location, location. That's kind of the first thing. It's, it's just of moderate interest, I think, but it was nearby. This was home base. It became home base for Jesus and the disciples there in Judea. Secondly, and I think this has many more elements to it, there are the players in the drama, right? Again, we're looking at the details. There are five sets that I want to point out for you, individual players, if you will, in this epic drama. First of all, we see the servant disciples right there at the beginning. He sent two of his disciples. We talked about this a little bit last week. Jesus uses his disciples to accomplish his will, right? We we see this over and over again, and I, I talked about the partnership that God has chosen to use. He could do He can do all of these things on his own. And yet, you don't see him doing that. He invites you and I, he certainly invited them to be part of the drama, to be part of this whole event. Now, it's interesting that what he asked them to do is something, when you look at it, you know, he says, listen, I want you guys to go to this, you know, go into the village, And when you get there, you'll see a donkey. Take it. Now, I don't know about you, but it's like one of those chores that your parents ask you to do. It's like, no, I don't want to do it. No, it's going to be embarrassing or it's going to be, I don't don't want to do that. And he says, yeah, if anyone hassles you, if anyone says, what are you doing? Just say, "Ah, the Lord has need of it. Oh, come on, Jesus. 
give us something more than that, right? It's like, you know, can we pay them or something? It's like, really? We're just gonna go and there's gonna be a donkey there. It, sometimes, I think this is important for us to understand, sometimes the things that the Lord asks us to do do not make sense. And they might even be a little off-putting where we just go, no, I don't wanna do that. I think that might be embarrassing. I mean, I just announced this, this need that we have for someone to sit at the table and oversee the distribution of DVDs at, at, at the baseball game. Now, some of you just thought right away, I'm not doing that. I might have to talk to people. Right? Some of you just, you thought that. I get it. Sometimes, that's the thing the Lord's gonna ask you to do. And he needs, he wants to use people who are available. These guys had no idea what they were being asked to do, right? All they, all they had was, I'm, Jesus is asking us to do this silly chore. Let one of the kids do it, right? A lot of times people are, they, they come up with this for, within the church. Can we get the youth group to do that? It's like, ah, yeah, you know, yeah. Let's get the teenagers, they'll do it. We'll make them. But these guys had no idea that they were being invited to be part of the greatest drama in all of human history. Just this one day, the most significant day. I've got significant days in my life, and like this, there's significant days that at the time I had no idea. I remember I was just driving down the road. You guys have heard me tell my testimony of how I came to faith in Christ. I'm driving down the road near my house, I stop and talk to a girl that I had gone to school with, a neighbor of mine. I just stop to talk to her. We have a little chat. She invites me to play racquetball. The next thing you know, I'm a Christian. Serious. And, and she had no idea either. She just, I mean, I'm, I'm sure she had an intention to share Christ with me. But it was significant. My entire life was changed because of that one moment, that one day. And not just, not just my life, but other people's lives. Later, years later, I'm driving home from work with my buddy, and he says, hey, wanna come over to my house and, and get a cheap haircut? There's this girl from church coming over, and, and, and you get a $10 or $5 probably at the time haircut. And it's like, yeah, I'm you know, broke, single guy, you bet. I had no idea. Her name was Lori. I didn't know. I just thought it was an in insignificant thing. I'm getting a cheap haircut. And then I met my wife. And because of that, my whole life has changed. We have days like this, and we, we sometimes don't have any idea. The, the point is, in, in our service to the Lord, there can be things that seem to us as the most insignificant, and God will use them in amazing ways. God uses seemingly small things in partnership with his people to accomplish the great things. For us, it's important for us to be open and also to have our eyes open to see those things. So the servant disciples are some of the players here in this story. The second thing I would point out is you've got an animal, which all the animal lovers would just, oh, that colt's gonna be in heaven, I know it. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Maybe, and that's the, the theological answer to that one for all the, the, the animal lovers is we simply don't know. We know there's a lot of creatures in heaven that we can't explain. Your cats and dogs may be there. I don't know. I saw a movie once. Anyway, there's a colt. Now, now you might think, okay, well, what's the deal with the colt? Well, well, we understand that at some level, but this is the most significant thing. In, in the significant day, here's this this detail that really is God in the details. Why the choice of a donkey? Well, because over 500 years prior to that, the prophet wrote about this very moment, this very day. Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine. Speaking of this day, the prophet said, rejoice greatly. 
O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a coal, colt, the foal of a donkey. Now the skeptic would go, oh, you know, they obviously wrote that afterwards or whatever. They made that. No. We've, we've got the historical record. There's, you know, we've got the manuscripts. The prophet wrote this 500 years prior to Christ fulfilling it. And certainly, Jesus knew what he was doing. He arranged all of this. It's the details. Because what was written previously was about the Messiah, whom he is presenting himself as here. Now, the other thing about the colt is, again, it's a small detail. He says, a colt on which no one has ever sat. What's the deal with that, Jesus? I think it's a, it's a beautiful detail. The colt was set apart for one purpose and one purpose only. Think about it. This animal was born for this purpose. You ever think about your purpose? What were you born for? What's your purpose? It might be something that seems so simple like this. Just this colt was born for one ride. What a glorious ride. The well-known author G.K. Chesterton wrote a poem about this donkey from the donkey, donkey's perspective. He wrote this, When fishes flew and forests walked, and figs grew upon thorn, some moment when the moon was blood, then surely I was born. With monstrous head and sickening cry and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody on all four-footed things. The tattered outlaw of the earth of ancient crooked will, starve, scourge, deride me, I am dumb, I keep my secret still, fools. For I also had my hour, one far fierce hour and sweet. There was a shout about my ears and palms before my feet. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I don't often read poetry, but it was, it was in so many of the things that I read relative to this passage. The donkey was special. I don't know if you sometimes feel like a donkey, kind of a maybe a less attractive animal, annoying animal for some. We can oftentimes feel unattractive, ungifted, inarticulate. These are the people the Lord uses. Even a donkey. I would just say this, and it's important for us to know, the Lord is not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. The Lord is not looking for Ability, he's looking for availability. It's important for us to recognize this donkey was just the beast of burden. And yet, what a glorious calling was on the donkey's life. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, relating to our own calling, he says, Consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. And the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. It's good for us to remember that. Notice that it, he says God has chosen. Again, you've got a couple of elements here. He's chosen to use people. And he's chosen to use people who sometimes might not seem particularly gifted, might not seem particularly attractive, might not seem like the ones God would choose. And those are the very ones that he wants to use. You and I. Are you a donkey? 
Seriously, do you see yourself as a donkey of a man or a woman? I think oftentimes we do. If you're available, God can and will use you for his own glory. Use this beast of burden for his own glory. The third group that I want to point out to you is the givers. We don't have a lot of details about this other than Jesus He just said, hey, go, there's going to be this animal. If they give you any trouble, just say these words, the magic words, the Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. And when you say that, they're going to say, okay. And that's exactly what happened. Now, some some guys, I think some commentators who believe less in the miraculous ministry of Christ say, oh, well, Jesus must have, he must have had a meeting with the owner and previously arranged this, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. That's just, that's totally born out of complete speculation. We don't have any more information. We, this is all we know about the whole thing. I believe, personally, if I was going to write my commentary about it, I just believe that Jesus was working in the heart of whoever owned the donkey. That's how he works, isn't it? He works in the hearts of people who love him, who believe in him. People who believe in Jesus, whose lives he has changed, we yield. We yield our possessions. We yield our things to him. It's a natural outgrowth of faith in Christ. It's also interesting, again, a minute detail in this larger picture. What is given to the Lord freely is returned blessed. He says, you just tell him. The Lord has need of it, and you'll have it back in a little bit. Now, you might say, well, you're kind of reading into that, but just imagine this. It's your donkey. Just say it's your donkey. It's tied up out front of your house, and the Lord says, I need that donkey. And his disciples come and say, the Lord has need of that donkey. Donkey that no one's ever sat on. It's just this young colt, and, and, and you don't even know why you have it in particular, but you have it, and, and the Lord wants to use it. And then all of this happens, and then the donkey comes back to you. Now, has the value of that donkey gone up? We don't know the rest of the story about the donkey or the owner of the donkey, but I would just say that donkey becomes pretty special. Right? It's like Elvis touched me. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like, are you kidding me? I don't know if it was my donkey, no one would ever sit on the donkey again. The donkey would have its own pasture. I'd worship the donkey. It's like, are you this donkey's so special? The king rode on the donkey. It returned, here's the point, it returned blessed. Don't miss that lesson. It's an important lesson here. What is given to the Lord freely is returned blessed. We see this in all the teaching about giving. Malachi 3.10, kind of the, 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 some of the most important verses about giving, Jesus, or God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing until it overflows. Th- there's the principle right there. God says, you give, you give, and I'm gonna bless it. You give, and I'm going to return it to you. It's going to be blessed. It's the same principle. The donkey was given to the Lord, and it returned blessed. It was more than it was previously. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 9, uh, 6 through 8. He says, I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves what? A cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that, uh, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have abundance for every good deed. Now, he says this. He says, if you sow sparingly, you're gonna reap sparingly. In other words, if you're stingy, God's gonna be stingy with you. But he says, if you sow bountifully, what? You're going to reap bountifully. When you give, it returns blessed. 
Now, this isn't a mathematical formula. Some guys, when they're talking about this, they go right into this mathematical formula and then, then on and on and on and on, you know, give to the ministry so I can buy a jet. We're not, that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about the simple principle that's here, the details in this text. The donkey was given freely and it was changed, returned, blessed. Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, your giving will be in secret. Your father who sees what is done in secret will do what? Will reward you. This is what he does. I would just say this. Do you have things that the Lord could use? Do you have things like a donkey that the Lord could use, that the Lord would use? We hang on to those because we're afraid we're gonna lose them. Right? And, and it, might be, it might be a day, it might be an hour in a day, it might be some time, it might be your money, it might be your car. It might, there's things that we have that we are possessors of and we hang on to them because we think, oh, I don't, wanna, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna lose it. And all the while God is saying, give it to me, it's gonna come back to you and you're gonna be blessed. That's, that's kind of the whole point. Can you imagine if the, if the owner of the donkey would have said no? Can you, and I think sometimes we're like that, where, where God would say, hey, you know that thing? I could use that for my glory. And we say, oh, no, that's my boat. Or, or whatever it is. Everyone with boats just said, what? No, but you know, it's like whatever it is, it's like, no. Can you imagine if he would have said no? What would Jesus have done if he would have said, I am not going to let you use my donkey today? But he didn't do that. He said, yeah. Giving is an act of faith. Giving is an act of worship. And I would just say this. If you refuse to worship the Lord, you will get no blessing. If he hadn't have done this, he wouldn't have got a blessing. Next, we see perhaps the most significant in the crowd, the worshipers. These are the ones, likely not residents of Judea, they seem to be more the enemies of Christ, but these were the followers of Christ who had come from Galilee. The ones that we see over and over had followed Jesus as he was doing the miracles. They take their coats and they, they put a coat on the donkey for him to ride on. They put their coats in the road. They cut down palm branches and lay them on the road. Culturally, this is what they're doing. They're welcoming a king. This is in contrast to what the Romans did. When the Romans would have a processional like this, it's much more like a modern day military parade where you, you come into the you know, whether it's a street or, or square or whatever, and you've got all your military might displayed, and it's all about power and pride, nationalism, all those things are on display. This is totally different. This is the king of peace. And rather than riding on a noble steed, he's on a humble beast of burden. But the people recognize it. And so they lay their garments in the road, the palm branches. This is the red carpet of the day. It's glorious. They're welcoming their king. And then we've got the praise that's coming out of their mouths. They went in front of those who follow. They were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. I'm glad we sang that song. Hosanna, Hosanna. It means save now. Save now. It comes from Psalm 118. The people knew what they were singing. The people knew exactly what they were saying. They were recognizing Jesus as Savior, as Messiah, as King. If you have time this week, maybe even later today, read Psalm 118. It's beautiful. But Jesus allowed this praise. He allowed this praise because it was so appropriate and it was so significant on this of the most significant of days. 
He was openly affirming his kingship, his identity as the son of David, the Messiah. The fifth group I want to point out is the haters. Seems like in all these stories there's some haters. You hate me because you ain't me. No, they, 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 they're the religious crowd from Jerusalem. And, and, and what it is they're hating is not even necessarily Jesus. They're hating the fact that the crowd is flocking to them and that the, the crowd is saying, this is the Messiah, right? They know the scriptures. They know that this title, this Psalm 118 that the people are singing, that the people are quoting, this is messianic. They know that and they hate it. In Luke chapter 19, we've got some detail that Mark doesn't include in his narration. But it says, uh, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. If these are quiet, these people who are singing my praises, if they're quiet, the stones are going to cry out. Now, I'd like to have seen that. Jesus is just saying, hey, you guys, you're not recognizing me. You're not believing in me. These guys are. They're praising me as I come in. Because, and even though the, the people didn't understand completely, right? We, even, even us as believers, we don't completely understand everything. But what little we understand, we recognize that Jesus is worthy of all praise. Certainly on this day, the people understood that their Messiah had come. He was riding into Jerusalem. And the religious guys missed it. They have no idea. Jesus is actually, it goes on to tell us, he's emotional about this whole thing. Think about that. This is such a significant day that Jesus is filled with emotion. In the, in the midst of all of this, as he comes in, Luke tells us, in fact, I want you to turn there. Turn to Luke chapter 19. You should read this with me. It says in Luke 19, verse 41, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. How beautiful is that? Now, you can just imagine all the things that were going through his mind. It's about people. Jesus doesn't see the city in the sense of structures. He sees people, his own people who he knows are about to reject him, crucify him. The very people that he's come to save, to love. He knows everything that's going on. And he says this, verse 42, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave you, uh, leaving you one stone upon another because you did not, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. But what, a, I mean, talk about prophecy. Talk about a significant day. Talk about a significant prophecy. Jesus is just saying, he's just saying to the city, he's like, I'm weeping over the city. As I look at the city, I recognize you're missing it. You don't recognize, if you had known what this day was all about, if you had only known what this day was all about, a day is coming when your enemies are gonna completely destroy this city. And so it was fulfilled. There are significant days in our lives, moments, and we gotta pay attention. Seriously, spiritually, we gotta pay attention to the significant days. Paul talks about a significant day. Uh, it was a day for all of us. It might be a day for you today. 
He talks about the day of salvation, which is exactly the terminology that Jesus used. This was a day of salvation. The king was coming. He says, if you knew the things that made for peace, in other words, if you'd known me, if you knew the ministry of the Messiah, I'm here for peace, to bring you peace. Paul says this, at the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. He's quoting from Isaiah, who wrote this, obviously, some 700 years previously. He wrote it about this moment. This is the day of salvation that had come to the nation. Are you a believer in Christ? Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? I pose that question to you. If not, today's the day of salvation. I'm looking around the crowd. I know most of you. I believe that most, if not all of you, are believers, but maybe there's someone here who was like me back in the day when I sat in church and I listened and and I tried to understand what was being said, but I actually had not put faith in Christ. If you'd only, if I'd only known the day. Today's the day of salvation. All you have to do is turn to Jesus. Put your faith in him. Receive him. Receive the king. He's here. Amen? And so for us who are believers, we had a day when it was the day. It was the day of salvation for us, the acceptable time. That day is today. That day is now for anyone who would respond to the gospel. Finally, I think the most wonderful thing about this lesson is the timing. It's probably the most significant aspect, especially for, for Bible teachers, for students of the scriptures. Again, if you're, if you're not a student of the scripture, the story is simple. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey here that it was just gonna wrap up his last week here on earth. Simple story, ah, but the good God is in the details. The most significant thing is there when you dig a little deeper. I want you to turn to Daniel chapter nine. Many of you are familiar with where I'm going here. I love every time I get to go through this particular lesson, Daniel chapter nine. Daniel was a man of God Daniel was a man who fasted and prayed. He sought the Lord. He, he, he was clearly a, a, a man of prayer. He was uh, like us, in a sense. He was a, a believer in Christ living in Babylon, right? Uh, that's, that's our lives. You are believers living in Babylon. We need to remember that. You don't, you don't live in a Christian world or a Christian nation. We're living in a foreign land, the Bible tells us. And so we can learn so many great lessons from him. He, he sought the Lord and the Lord gave to Daniel the most significant prophecy as it relates to the timeline of all things in the future, okay? This is one of the things that we love about Daniel. In fact, it's one of the things the skeptics say, Daniel's prophecies are so significant that most skeptics look at them and say, well, there's no way. This was made up after the fact. The problem is you've got the historical evidence that says otherwise. This is what the, this was the prophecy that God gave to Daniel. It's called the 70-week the prophecy. It's the key to understanding all things in the future. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Pay attention. He says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. Verse 26, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. 
But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Okay, there's a ton here. There's a ton here. We'll just start at the beginning. 70, he says, this is the prophecy. Seventy weeks have been decreed. Okay, these are 70 seven-year periods of time. It can't be understood any other way because of all the things that are contained in here. It's 70 seven-year periods of time. So that's, that's the big picture of what we're dealing with here. 490 years. Now, he says, this is what the prophecy is about. This is what the 70 weeks are about. For your people and your holy city. Well, he's given this to Daniel. So who are the holy people? The Jews, right? This is Israel. What's the holy city? Jerusalem. So he says, listen, this prophecy of 490 years has to do with the Jews and with their city, the city of God. Okay, you tracking with me? Many of you guys have heard this before, right? I love this stuff. It's so wonderful. Again, what are we looking at? We're looking at the details. The details about the particular day in which Jesus rode into Jerusalem. So we know that the, the prophecy that Daniel has is for 490 years. It has to do with the Jews. And then he says, this is what it's all about. He says, it's about the end. It's going to finish or complete transgression. It's going to make an end of sin. It's gonna, there's going to be atonement for iniquity, it's going to usher in or bring in everlasting righteousness. Vision is going to be sealed up. Prophecy is going to be sealed up. And the most holy place is going to be anointed. What is he saying? He said, this, is, this whole thing is it. We're talking about everything is wrapped up in this prophecy. Sin is going to be done with. Finally, over. And the most holy place is going to be anointed. So, He's talking about basically all things. Now, he says, verse 25. So, so that's what this is about. That's what's going to happen. He says, now, verse 25, you are to know and discern. What does that mean? It means it's something that's knowable. It's something that should be figure outable, if you will. You, you should be able to understand that. Now, we are in the unique position. Daniel certainly couldn't understand it, but we're in the unique position to be able to look back in history and understand this. There are two date stamps given for this prophecy. He says, number one, from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So he says from, so that's the starting point for this 490-year prophecy. And so all you have to do is look, at, look back in history and say, what is this all about? When is this? Now, the, the scholars are somewhat divided over this because there were different things being done under Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, Ezra, of course, rebuilt the temple, but it was Nehemiah who restored the city. And so we look at that decree, which, because it was a secular government, that is knowable. That is something that you can find out. And we know that this decree went forward March 14th, 445 B.C. There, that's a particular date that the king said to Nehemiah, okay, Nehemiah had petitioned him, you remember, right? He, he prayed, he was, he was depressed because of the, dis, the destruction of, of Jerusalem. It was, it, was, it was sacked. And he sought the Lord, he prayed, he fasted and he prayed. It's interesting that when he fasted and prayed, something seriously significant happened. As Daniel fasted and prayed, something significant happened. There's a little clue there. Date stamp number one, March 14th, 445 B.C., when Artaxerxes gave the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, the uh, author, and I think he was a Scotland Yard investigator, Christian Sir Robert Anderson, did all the math and all the details of this. And he records it all in a book called The Coming Prince, which, is, which has become kind of a classic it, just for the sake of this particular study, using the Babylonian calendar of the day, which is 360-day year, 
if you move forward from date stamp number one, March 14th, 445 BC, and you move forward 1,000 or 173,880 uh, days, you arrive at April, April 6, 32 AD. This day. Do you understand the significance? He said, from the issuing of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. And so we move forward these 173,880 days, which is the 69 weeks. He talked about the, the seven weeks and the 62 weeks. The, the first part was the, the time that it took to completely restore and rebuild everything. And then the time that ended with this presentation of Jesus Christ. It's, it's incredible. It's the details. The good God is in the details. On the exact day, Jesus, the Messiah, presented himself to his people. If you'd have known. They're, they're telling him, hey, could you tell these guys to be quiet? Jesus says, man, if you guys only knew. If you only knew. This is the most significant day. Jesus Christ is riding into Jerusalem, accepting, receiving praise, because he's the Savior who's come to save. This whole thing is the plan of God. With all the details, it's the plan of God. Isaiah said, the Lord of hosts has planned. And who can frustrate it? And as for his outstretched hand, who can turn it back? I love it. As we look at these things, we see that God is sovereign over all of these things. Jesus knew every little detail. He fulfilled every little, even the minutest details, all for his glory. As we look at that last half of Daniel's prophecy, of course, we see he, he was presented. The Messiah, the Prince, did arrive. And then we see the next thing he says, and he's going to be cut off. What happened? He was cut off. He was killed. And then it fast forwards. There is 69 of those weeks accounted for in the presentation of Christ. But then there's a 70th. There's a final seven-year period of time that hasn't started yet. We're waiting for that. And he describes it. And it's all about the things that are happening in the future. But when you look back and you see the plan of God, the plan of God that's going to happen, that's going to be accomplished, that could not be stopped, we also look forward and say, you know what? The plan of God will not be stopped. It's going to happen exactly as he said. And the good God is in the details. Nebuchadnezzar said, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation and all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? God's so good. Let's have the band come up and they're gonna lead us in worship. I know that probably none of you thought about these things as you were coming to church today or even the kind of thematically the idea of the significance of one day, the significance of one event, one episode in our lives, certainly not thinking about this particular episode, but our life is made up of things like this. A life is made up of, of seemingly inf insignificant things that God is using to accomplish his will. Are you the servant? Are you a servant of Christ? When Christ says, hey, hey, I want you to go do this, are you the one who says, here I am, Lord, send me? If you're not, you should be. Right, all of us as believers. Maybe you're the guy that owns the cult. Are you the guy that owns the cult and you're saying, oh, Lord, no, I wanna hang on to my cult. Hang on, but you're not going to get blessed. Let go, and you're going to be blessed. Amen? And we want to be counted amongst the crowd who's giving praise. 
We want to give praise to Jesus. Let's stand and sing to him. Father, we thank you for the description contained here in these verses, in this significant day, these great verses that tell us about the day that you, the conquering king, king came into the city. Lord, we want to receive you like these so many, spreading our coats before you, waving the palm branches, laying them down. Lord, we want to roll out the red carpet in our heart and say, welcome, King Jesus. Have your way with us. Thank you, God, for blessing us with your life. We receive you this morning. In Jesus' name.